In this tutorial, we're going to walk you through the process of exporting your final model out as a batch render to get an image sequence, which we will later reconstitute together into one fully animated turntable. So as you can see right here, I have my finished model from my 8mm Bell & Howell camera. And let's go ahead and start by doing a test render. And I'm going to click right here on this icon. If I mouse over it, it, it says render the current frame. That's exactly what I want to do. So I'll click on that, and it'll pull up the render view right here. Now, by default, this is going to be rendering through the Maya Software Renderer, which you can see featured in this drop-down right here. Now, the Maya Software Renderer, it's an efficient renderer, but it's not exactly what I would consider a robust renderer. As you can see, um, my model is, is more in the faceted side. This renderer does not really support the smooth preview mode, and it also doesn't do light calculations as efficiently as some other rendering engines. I'm going to click on this icon right here. All right, if I mouse over, it's keep image. And what it'll do is it will basically save this current render. Now, that's nice because when we do subsequent renders, we will have the ability to scrub back and forth between an older render and a newer render for comparison and contrasting purposes. OK. We want to use a mental ray rendering engine, but you can see that it's not featured right here. What you'll need to do is you'll need to install that. That is not something that comes natively with the Maya 2016 version. You can go ahead and do a Google search for mental ray Maya 2016 and find the plugin and download it. And after you've downloaded and installed the plugin, you'll want to make sure to click on Windows come down to Settings and Preferences, and go to your Plugin Manager. Now this window will pop up right here. I'm just going to maximize it a little bit. And you want to scroll all the way down towards the bottom. And you're going to see this section right here. And you'll find a plugin called Maya2MR.Bundle. Go ahead and select both Loaded and Auto Load so that it loads each time that you open up Maya. And we'll go ahead and close this. And going back to the Render View, if we click on that drop down. Mental Ray will now be one of our options. So let's go ahead and select that. Come right here to this icon right under File, and that will render the current frame. We'll click on that, and you can see that we've got a much better render than what we had previously. I'll click on the Keep Image icon, grab my little uh, slider bar down here at the bottom, and I can scrub back and forth between those two different renders. All right. Now, you can also see that the given aspect ratio as how we're framing in our subject matter is, is kind of poor. It's not really working for me. This aspect ratio does not complement the subject matter. And so what I want to do is go into my camera settings and adjust it so that it does. I'm just going to minimize my render view. And I'm going to click on my outliner um, so that it pops up simultaneously with my viewport. I want to select the perspective camera. I'm going to click on the channel box tabs. And we want to adjust the horizontal film aperture and the vertical film aperture right down here in the camera inputs. Now, right now, it is set 1.47 by 0.94. Um, if I come right here to the icon, it's right underneath show, and I turn that on, um, I turn on my film gate, and this shows me essentially what the camera sees. And this width that we have for this film game is that 1.417 that's set for the horizontal film aperture. And the vertical measurement is that vertical film aperture setting. If you wanted to set this up so it kind of had more of a cinematic aspect ratio, you could set that to 1.6 for the horizontal aperture. And you could set it to 0.9 for the vertical film aperture. Right now you can see that those settings, once again, doesn't really complement my subject matter. For the, so for the purposes of what I'm wanting to do here, I'm going to enter in a value of 1 and 1. And it, you know, that um, aspect ratio doesn't really fit well within my viewport. So I'm just going to click on this little um, divide here between the outliner and the viewport and just drag it over so it forces my viewport to be more square so that I can see all of my camera as it fits within that film gate. 
all right? Now, another thing that we can play around with, if you have any concerns with the degree of perspective that you're seeing right here, you can always play around with the camera focal length, which is immediately below the horizontal and vertical film aperture settings. By default, it's set to 35. That is, 35 is in the 35 millimeter camera, which is what most point and shoot cameras have. If you want that perspective to be less severe, go ahead and increase that number. Now if I increase it to a 70, I'm going to have to pull the camera back, but you can see that there has been a rather significant difference between the 35 millimeter and the 75 millimeter. Now if you want it to be more extreme, you'll make it a number that's less than 35 millimeters, but I'm going to go ahead and go with 70 in this particular instance right here. Now, it's not just enough that we've adjusted the horizontal film aperture and the vertical film aperture in the camera settings, but we also need to go into our render settings and set the renderable camera settings to match these right here. I'm going to go ahead and click on this icon, right, display render settings, and it'll pull up this window. I'm going to mouse or, or to scroll down here towards the bottom to the image size. By default, it's set to an HD 540 preset, which matches the previous horizontal and vertical film aperture settings. Now, because I set that to a one to one, if I click on this drop down, I can find a 1K square preset. Um, some other common presets that you'll probably be using later in the semester might be the HD 720 or the HD 1080 both of which are 16 by 9 aspect ratio. But for right now, I'm going to go ahead and select the 1K square. I'll go ahead and close my render settings for the moment and do a new render. Okay, and here we go. I'm going to go ahead and save this. Um, and that looks you know, quite a bit better than what we were dealing with before. Also right here, as I scrub back and forth between the two, you can see the contrast between the 35 millimeter um, focal length and the 70 millimeter focal length. Okay, a few other th things that I want to adjust. Right now, I'm going to click on the render settings to pull this window back up. I'm going to click on the quality tab. Now by default your overall quality is probably going to be set to a 0.25. I actually want to increase that to at least a 1 and we'll do another render right here. Actually I'm going to make sure that I save this particular render so we can compare it with it with the new render and we'll click on the render new frame. All right, you'll notice it's taking a little bit longer to do that render. We'll go ahead and save this one as well. And if I click on this one-to-one -one icon right here, and mouse over, it says display real size. This is where we'll really begin to notice the difference in the quality, as you can start to see it right in here in the rings and the camera lens. This is the quality of 0.25, and you can see that it's a little grainier. There's a little bit more noise. You can also begin to see it along the contours of this object. If we go over to the quality setting of one, that graininess and noise has gone away. All right, so we want to keep that right there. I'm going to minimize the render view, make sure that the perspective camera is selected again, and now I'm going to go to the attribute editor. I'm going to collapse the camera attributes in the film back, and we're going to open up environment. Actually, real fast, I'm just going to pull up the render view. What I'm about to adjust is this black background color. The problem with that black background color is that it starts to create contrast issues with the sections of the form of our model that are dropping off exclusively into shadow. And so as a result, we kind of get a false reading on where the contours for the bottom of this lens might be, for the bottom of the body of the camera, etc. And in some lighting cases where it casts more shadow onto one side of the model, it can completely just make the model feel flat, um, make the model just hard to read. And that's, that's not what we're trying to do for whomever we're sharing our model with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this background color and I'm just going to slide it up a little bit. All right, I want to lighten it up so it's kind of a middle of the road gray um, that will both work with our lighter values and with our darker values. 
And let's go ahead and do another render. All right, we'll go ahead and save this so that we can scrub back and forth between the two different render states. All right, I think I went just a little bit too light. You'll want to do a couple of renders until you get it exactly where you want it. All right, keep that image. I think I'm a little too light still. We'll go ahead and do one more render. <laughs> okay. And I like where this one is going. All right, so we'll go ahead and go with that one right there because I feel like it does a decent job showcasing my model. Let's go ahead and close render settings and now prepare this model for animation. So I still have the outliner open, and if you notice in the outliner, my model is constituted out of several different pieces and parts. All right, it is a lot easier to animate this if Maya is recognizing all these different pieces and parts as one object. So I'm gonna do a drag selection over top of everything or I could select all those individual pieces and parts right here in the outliner window. But in the outliner window, you can see that everything that needs to be selected is selected. Now I'm going to click on Mesh and come down to Combine. And Maya will recognize them now as one object. All right. I think Maya is still thinking. All right, here we go. Maya froze on me, and I had to um, kind of restart this and, and get it back up to the same point where I left off. Um, but anyway, so I've now combined everything into one object, but you can see that it has left a whole bunch of different transform um, nodes that are associated with, um, with those previous individual objects. To clean this up, I'm going to click on Edit, and I'm going to come down to Delete All by Type and select History, and it'll go ahead and delete those, um, those old instances. Now, if ever your Maya scene begins to lag as you're trying to navigate your camera around, you're experiencing some severe latency with the program, you, it might be time for you to click on Edit, come down to Delete All by Type and delete the history. What that is going to do is it is going to clear out the inputs in the history states with each of the individual objects. For instance, if we were to create a new cube right here in the grid, all right, so I'll just go ahead and draw this cube out here. You can see in this cube we have the polycylinder inputs, the width, the height, the depth, subdivisions. You know, we can go ahead and play around with some of these. And... Um, you know, if we were to select some faces and extrude them out like so, and then let's say we subdivide. All right, every time we're performing one of these actions on an object, it is building up a history state. Um, and as that history state gets bigger and bigger and bigger for multiple objects within a scene, it can cause file bloat. And to fix that, like I was saying earlier, come down to Edit, Delete All by Type, and Delete the History, and it'll delete all those inputs and tidy up your file. And Maya should be more responsive as a result. So let me just go ahead and get rid of that object right there. Okay, and we will come back to animating this object. Now, looking at the timeline, you can see by default I have 120 frames visible to me. All right, you can see that um, I have this little slider here down at the bottom because it's not showing me all, or I'm sorry, I have 200 frames available in the timeline, but it's only showing me 120 of those. All right, now this field right here shows the first frame in the timeline. This field shows the first visible frame. This shows the last visible frame and the duration of the timeline. In this particular instance, I'm going to take the last visible frame 
and set that to 240 and make sure actually we'll want to make sure that the slider is, is all the way over to the left so it says one the first visible frame and we'll put 240 here for the last visible frame we're going to make our animated turntable be 240 frames because when we play that back at a frame rate of 24 frames per second it will make our animated turntable 10 seconds long so now that we've adjusted the timeline, make sure that your, your timeline indicator is set to frame one. And go ahead and right click on rotate Y and come down to key selected. Now what we've done is we've set a keyframe right there. So we've recorded this value for that attribute at that particular point in time. Now go ahead and take your timeline indicator all the way over to 240 frames. What you want to do is you want to make sure that this icon right down here in the lower right hand corner is turned on and that it is highlighted in blue. That is um, your auto keyframe toggle. That means when that is turned on that if I'm at a different point in my timeline and I manually enter in a value, I'm going to say negative 360 because that will cause the camera to rotate in a clockwise direction. The second that I press return, it is going to record that particular keyframe. If this were not turned on, it would not record that keyframe automatically, and I would have to manually right-click on it and key the selected at that point in time. All right, now we can scrub through on the timeline, or actually I can just go ahead and hit play there, and we, we can watch the camera's animation. Now two things that I'm noticing, first of all, the framing isn't the best for my model because a portion of my model actually ends up cropping um, right down here at the bottom of my film gate. You can see there it goes right there. So while this is rotating, I can actually update the camera live and it'll be maybe a little on the laggy side. But I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and reposition my camera. where I make sure that everything is fully featured within the film game. All right, if that's too difficult for your computer to manage, you can simply hit the stop or press the escape key to abort that animation. All right, I'm gonna actually move it up just a little bit and tip it down, scrub through my timeline, and I think for the most part I like how that looks. All right, now, um, next thing that I want to just address is if we click on this icon just immediately to the right of the auto keyframe toggle that will pull up our timeline settings you want to make sure that your playback speed is set to real time and not half or twice or other all right that way we'll get a sense for the actual timing of this over the course of our animated turntable one final thing that I do want to address is as this animates, by default, it has um, it has an ease in and an ease out set to these keyframes. If you look right here, it's going to slow down to a stopping point at that 240 frame mark, but it's going to slow into the motion um, coming out of that frame one. Now that can be a little distracting in terms of the nature and how we want to feature this model. So we're going to go ahead and change it so that there is no slow in and slow out and that the camera rotates at one nice consistent speed. So I'll go ahead and select stop right there. And I'm going to come over to my fourth viewport option down. That's going to give me a split view of the graph editor and also of the viewport. Now let's just zoom out here in the graph editor the exact same way that you would be navigating in your viewport. And we're going to see this graph right here. And it's going to show us the value of that, that rotate Y at that one frame mark and the value of that rotate Y at the 240 frame mark. Now this doesn't really fit well visually within this space. So if I do a drag selection over both keyframes and press F as in Frank on my keyboard, it'll maximize that point of view. Now this curve shows where it starts slow and then it kind of builds up and it eases into it's, it's terminal velocity probably right here around the 84 frame mark and right around the 156 frame mark it starts to actually ease out of that motion as is depicted by this curve. Now with both keyframes selected 
if I come right here into this shelf, this will show me my tangents, all right? Currently, and by default, the auto tangents are turned on, which creates, creates this ease in and ease out. But if I click on this one right here, linear tangents, it's just going to turn into a straight diagonal line between the two, eliminating that ease in and ease out. So now I'm gonna go back to the half outliner and half viewport window and press play and it should rotate at an uninterrupted speed. All right, so let's go ahead and hit stop. Now we are just about to the point where we're ready to render this out of Mayam. The last thing that we need to do is we need to set our batch render settings. Now when I'm discussing a batch render, what will happen is instead of just rendering out manually one frame at a time, we can just set our settings and tell Maya to just go for it and render all 240 frames. To do so, go ahead and click on your render settings. All right, make sure you're back over in your common tab. And we're going to work with the file output and the frame range and the renderable, renderable camera settings. First thing that we'll do is we'll go ahead and set a name prefix. This will be the name that will be assigned to each and every one of those 240 frames. I'm going to go ahead and call this 8mm camera, all right, because of the camera that we're rendering right here. Now the image format, I want to go with a format that is going to be more universally used and recognizable. To keep it simple, to keep it safe, I'm going to go ahead and go with a JPEG. Now I want to make sure that I have my compression quality turned up on my JPEG so I'm getting the maximum resolution that I can. With the frame slash animation extension, Right now it's just set to name slash ex or dot extension, and that will just allow us to render a single frame. If we want to render multiple frames, we'll need to select one of the other options. One of the best things that you can do is use the name dot number dot extension. All right, so you can see um, right up here at the top as we look at this first section, um, it the first you know the file naming convention will be displayed as 8mmm camera. 0001.jpg. Now that number right there it has four different integers due to the frame padding. Now we don't need four. Let's go ahead and scale that back to three because we're going to be keeping this rendered sequence within the hundreds, not the thousands. And now it shows that it'll start at frame one and it'll render through frame 10 because our frame range is only set to those numbers. If we select the end frame and enter in a value of 240, and look back up here, now you can see that this will go from a range of 1 to 240 frames. All right, the last thing you want to do is make sure that it is going to be rendering your perspective camera. So we'll go ahead and select that. We should be able to hit close. Click on the modeling drop down in the upper left hand corner and go to rendering, select render, and come down to batch render. Maya will save your scene, that's okay. And then if you look in this field right down here, this is, this is a little update field, and it'll, it'll feed us with the progress um, of each individual render. All right, so 50%, 75%, 100% frame one is done, and it'll go through all 240 frames right there. All right, so I had um, previously rendered out this sequence, this full sequence right here. It, and so what I'm doing is I'm just kind of scrolling through these individual frames. Um, so let's just say now you have all 240 frames rendered out through here. And now what we need to do is take each individual one of these and essentially stitch them all together into one video sequence. Now the easiest way that we can do that is actually through Adobe Photoshop. If I click on File and come down to Open, I want to go to where I have those saved. Let's see, so I have them in my Downloads folder. All right, I'm going to go to the 8mm uh, camera folder. Go to the Images folder, right, right there at the top. And here we go. 
So I'm going to go ahead and select the first one right there. And you'll notice right down here at the bottom, generally this image sequence is grayed out. But in this particular instance, it's not, and it allows us to select it. The reason for that is, is because when you select 8mmcamera.001.jpg, it recognizes that it falls into an alphanumeric sequence with several other files. Um, so if we select the image sequence and hit open, it's going to ask us this question next, what frame rate do we want to use? You can go ahead and click on this drop down and 24 frames is one of the presets and we can go ahead and hit OK. And then it's going to open this up right here. Now if you look over in the layers palette you're going to see that instead of seeing a single layer you'll have a video group. And if the timeline is not visible for you down here at the bottom you can go ahead and click on window and come down and turn, and turn the visibility of the timeline on. Now here in the timeline, we'll go ahead and hit play, and you can see that it's it's kind of playing back at a slightly choppy rate. Generally what needs to happen is it needs to play through in its, its full entirety at least once, and then it'll give you a, a better representation of what the actual playback speed will be like. So I'll let this just complete its cycle right here. All right, so this is what it'll be looking like as it rotates in space. Okay, now just having the camera rotate once generally doesn't make for very good showmanship as far as um, an animated turntable goes. So I'd actually recommend that you rotate it at least three times or a maximum of five times. And that can be easily achieved here in Photoshop as well. I'll just go ahead and click on the stop right there. And if you look right, right here at the bottom of this timeline, you have a zoom in and you have a zoom out. Let's go ahead and zoom out a little ways. Whoops, I don't need my ca calendar to be open. I'm going to zoom that out about right there. I'm going to go ahead and select this video layer in the timeline and I will hit Command or Control J and that'll create a duplicate of it. Now it'll put it to do duplicate linearly immediately following the original. We'll go ahead and select that and hit Command or Control J one more time. All right, now we have three instances of it so the camera will rotate within this video a maximum of three times. The last thing that we need to do is click on File, come down to Export, and you will find a Render Video option. Go ahead and select that, and um, Photoshop will need to think for just a second, and that's going to pull up our Export Video Options. Okay, let's go ahead and give this a name, and I'll call this 8mm Camera. We want to select the folder where it'll be saved to. In this instance, I'm just going to go ahead and save it to my desktop. Okay, it'll be rendering through the Adobe Media Encoder. And go ahead and select your format. And I'm going to keep mine at H.264 because that's just a nice, efficient compression algorithm um, that'll give you the most bang for your buck. You want to keep the document size, you want to keep the document frame rate, you want to have a high quality and make sure that your range is set for all the frames. Okay, and then simply go ahead and hit render and it'll take just a minute or so for it to export this video. Alright, it looks like this finished so let's go ahead and take a look at my desktop and there it is, 30 seconds long and we have the full animation. Now you just go ahead and take this and you would upload it to Vimeo or YouTube in preparation of um, sharing the animated turntable with the rest of the class on, um, during the class critique.